Dr. Moeller for the privilege of stewarding this pulpit once again. It's uh, such a great honor for me, and thank you for your very kind and gracious words of introduction, your personal friendship, you and Mary, to Michelle and to me, and to the blessing that, uh, that you uh, have been and continue to be uh, to my life and, and to my ministry. It's great to be here among so many uh, former students and colleagues at the Kentucky Baptist Convention, dear friends. Uh, it's good to be home. I'm especially thankful to be here on the day that close personal friends, Dr. Greenway and Dr. Stenson are honored. We thank the Lord for them and what he uh, has called them to do. Uh, it's remarkable as uh, we uh, look at how God has used this seminary and its influence in our lives and in the life of this convention. I certainly would not be fit uh, to be serving as the president of the International Mission Board uh, were it not for the investment of uh, the faculty uh, of this seminary and the staff and all who have made this seminary what it is and have uh, touched my life indelibly. When we think about the reach of, uh, of our seminary, Southern Seminary, and, and uh, the place where leaders have been called from to go to Southwestern, to go to the International Mission Board, to go to Midwestern Seminary, to go to Southeastern Seminary, to go to the ERLC and uh, to the North American Mission Board and the IMB. In the words of Dr. Moeller, that is not a conspiracy, though it may seem one. This is a seminary, and it's a seminary where leaders are trained. And I am thankful to have been and continue to be a part of this seminary and its proud graduates and of this seminary family. Thank you, faculty and staff, for investing in God's kingdom as you invest in the men and women who are serving the church and taking the gospel to the nations. And thank you students on behalf of the churches that you serve, the mission fields upon which you will pour out your lives and the lost with whom you will share the good news of the gospel. Thank you for doing the hard work of studying to show yourselves approved workers who need not be ashamed. Michelle and I are grateful through the cooperative program to have the privilege of investing in you, even as on behalf of 3,700 missionaries and 300 IMB staff members who are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, we are grateful for everyone who is investing in us and in that great work, everyone who supports the International Mission Board and her missionaries through the cooperative program. Should you feel sense of calling uh, to be one of those IMB missionaries, uh, know that there is good news. The IMB is again sending new missionaries to the field. Uh, there are opportunities for you to serve overseas for six months, 12 months, 24 months, or even on a career path through the IMB. To that end, if you have any interest or have sensed a calling to cross-cultural overseas missions, I would invite you uh, to join uh, some of our IMB personnel. Uh, meet them at the Bevan Center immediately uh, following chapel today, and you can learn more about the opportunities, and we will treat you to lunch as well. Uh, so hope you will take advantage of that. Whether or not you're called to cross-cultural overseas mission work, since you're a part of the church, you are a part of the mission of the church. We all are a part of the mission of the church. During this week, when we focus upon a uh, supper in the upper room, upon Gethsemane, Golgotha, and the garden tomb, the final glorious culmination of the events of Holy Week, which we still await, is also, I believe, a very appropriate topic. In the upper room, what was the purpose of the new covenant in his blood? In Gethsemane's garden, why did Jesus pray, not as I will, but as you will, while others slept? At Golgotha, what was finished when he gave up his spirit? What does his empty tomb mean for us and for the world? All of those questions are answered in two verses of Scripture that I will turn your attention to in the book of Revelation. Revelation 7 Verses 9 and 10, this is a part of the vision that God allowed John to see. And in this part of the vision, Revelation 7, God has allowed John to see the final glorious culmination 
of what happened in that upper room, what happened in the garden, what happened upon the cross, and what happened as the Lord walked forth from the tomb. Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen and amen. This vision of heaven that God gave to John and through John God has given the church is not only the culmination of the events of Holy Week, it is what drives the ministry and the mission of the church to this very day and will continue to drive the ministry and mission of the church until the Lord Jesus comes to claim his church. That Vision must be what we work toward, what we give our lives to, and what, if called upon, we are willing to give our lives for. If the vision is, in fact, what drives the ministry and mission of the church, then it is essential, I believe, is it not, that those who lead in the ministry and mission of the church understand this vision. Because you are here where leaders are trained and found, it's safe for me to assume Uh, that you are presently or soon will be leading in some ministry or mission effort of the Lord's church. So let's together seek to better understand what that ministry and mission is and should be by asking some very basic questions of the vision that drives our ministry and mission. Uh, Let's begin with the question, who? John records, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Note that the vision of heaven is inclusive. There are qualifying adjectives here, every and all. The great innumerable multitude that John sees and that will someday be assembled, will not be comprised of a crowd of people from some nations, many tribes, most peoples, and a bunch of languages. The great innumerable multitude will be comprised of a crowd of people from every nation, all tribes, all peoples, all languages. Now that's a big difference. (laughs) And that's where you come in. For you see, the great innumerable multitude could already be comprised of a crowd of people from some nations, many tribes, most peoples, and a bunch of languages. That has been accomplished by those who have gone before us, which means if that's the vision, you can go home. Students, you don't have to enroll in classes. You don't need your degree. And whatever you're trying to do now to wrap up the end of the semester as painful as that is, well, you can step back from that. Faculty, you can go make the money that your intellect and discipline could earn you in another field. Staff, there are probably places uh, where the wages may be better and the benefits as well. Go find them. All the frustrations and heartaches of serving in churches or seminaries or spending your life on the mission fields of the world are for nothing if the vision has already been fulfilled but they aren't for nothing. And you did need to go to class this morning and you must go this afternoon. And you will need the training represented by your degree and your intellect is well spent lecturing in these classrooms and your life well spent laboring in these offices, buildings and lawns, the frustrations and heartaches of local church ministry are necessary as is doing whatever it takes to get the gospel to the very ends of the earth because the adjectives say every and all. The vision has not yet been fulfilled. And it is for the fulfillment of the vision that this institution was birthed and exists today and that you are here. For those who are the who of the vision are still out there. 
They are still unreached. They are still among the lost. And the vision cannot be fulfilled until the great innumerable multitude can include every nation, all tribes, all peoples, and all languages. They are the who of the vision. And until they have been reached, we still have work to do. Second, we ask of the vision, where? Again, John says, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Where? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Where? There. Before the throne and before the Lamb. There where God wants them to be. For he wants that none should perish the scriptures say. There where before the foundations of the world were set in place, God chose them to be, for he has chosen people from every nation, all tribes, peoples, and languages. The vision of Revelation 7 reminds us of the there, the house not made with hands, the kingdom that is not of this world, the Father's home with many mansions, a gleaming white city, whose river runs glad. The vision is evidence of a new heaven and a new earth, the land of the living, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. The vision testifies to the kingdom whose radiance is like a most rare jewel, the scriptures say, where the glory and honor of the nations resides, a place where God dwells with men, a place where we know as we are known and we see as we are seen a place where the river of the water of life flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and where the tree of life with its leaves for the healing of the nations grows. The Scriptures bear testimony to the reality of that place, and that is where the who must be for the vision to be fulfilled. But what we know is that they aren't there yet. And those who must be there in order for the vision to be fulfilled must be reached. And it is left to us to go and reach them. They're still on the farm, still among the subdivisions and in the cities. They're still on the islands and in the jungles and on the plains and the plateaus. They are still in the deserts and in the mountains. Some, mind you, have several Bibles in their homes, but they have not been reached. Others don't have a verse of Scripture in their language. They have not been reached. Some have a church building within a mile of their house, and their names may be upon the membership rolls, but they have not been reached. Some have never seen a church building. Some know plenty of Christians, and they think they are one. Some have never met a follower of Jesus, nor heard his name spoken. They have not been reached. And that is what they all have in common. They are still lost. And unless we, who have been sent, go, unless they hear and believe, they won't be there. The vision will not be fulfilled. And yet you and I know the vision will be fulfilled. And the great privilege that we have is to be a part of it. Third, we ask of the vision how. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, where standing before the throne of the Lamb. How? How? Clothed in white robes, John observes. Now, the Bible informs us that human beings are not clothed in white robes. We were born dead in our trespasses and sins, conceived in sin, bearing the curse of Adam, all of sin. We are slave to sins. We're outwardly wasting away. We stand condemned through our sin. We've earned the wages of death. And so the question comes, how can a people so stained with guilt be here in the vision clothed in white robes? 
Well, that is the how of salvation. How? A prophecy came to pass. How? Law was fulfilled. How? Sorrow was born. A curse was carried. A debt was paid. How? Judgment was carried out and wrath was satisfied. How? His wounds brought us healing. He atoned for our sin. A Messiah came. A lamb was slain. His death brought life. And he has become the first fruits of the resurrection. It is the how of salvation. And as we share the gospel by the empowering of the Holy Spirit and through the redeeming work of the Holy Spirit, we know that lost are found and orphans are adopted and unworthy are made worthy and the sin-stained soul is washed by the blood. The slave is redeemed. The blind is given sight. The sinner is saved by grace through faith unto good works. And then, brothers and sisters, the grave clothes are replaced with white robes. And that is how the who will be there. And some of them will be there because you have seen the vision of heaven. And that vision has become the vision not just of John and not just of the church, but of your life. And as to that that you labor, it is that to that that you live your life and give your life. That's how. Finally, we ask of the vision, why? Why is really the first question. It's the child's favorite question. <laughs> it's the adolescent's most frequently asked question and often with an attitude. <laughs> But why is an important question, and it's the ultimate question of the vision. John, allowing us to see the vision, provides us with the answer. After this I looked, and behold, who? Well, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Where? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. How? clothed in white robes. Why? With palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Why? Why an upper room? Why a garden? Why a cross? Why a tomb? Why a vision where people who don't deserve to be in his presence have joy in his presence and are welcomed into his presence? Why? Because he is worthy. Why? Because he is Lord. Why? Because with his blood he purchased men for God. Why? Because he is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Why? Because he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Why? Because he is the beloved Son of the Father whom the Father wants you to love. Why? Because he took the form of a servant and he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why? Because he is the firstborn from among the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence and sit on his throne adorned with our worship for all eternity. Why? Because he is worthy. He is worthy of our living. He is worthy of our dying. He is worthy of our worship. 
This vision, the vision of heaven where all the tears have been wiped away and there's no more death or sorrow or pain and the Father is being praised in every language he's placed upon the tongues of men and his beloved Son is being worshipped by those who owe him everything. This vision finds not only us there, but it finds all those to whom we have been sent out to the very far reaches of the globe to tell the good news. This vision was burned into the heart of John, inked in God's holy book and became the passion of the church. And it must still be the passion of the church. It is the purpose of our lives and it is the purpose of the mission and ministry work to which we apply ourselves. This is the vision that I would encourage you to carry with you to your ministry field or across the seas to the mission field. It is the vision that causes us to labor in the field. It is a vision that will keep us laboring in the field. Might this, brothers and sisters, be for each of us individually and for the church of the Lord Jesus collectively the vision that informs our ministry, that motivates us for ministry, sustains us in our ministry, and results from our ministry. Where there is no vision, cried out the teacher, the people perish, but God in his grace has given us vision. Let us go in fulfillment of his vision. Pray with me. Father, thank you for what you allowed John to see and have now allowed us to see the picture of the beauty and the wonder and the glory of heaven. Thank you, Lord, for including the every and the all. People from every nation, from all the tribes, from all the languages, And thank you, Lord, not only for including us, by saving us, but thank you for including us in the fulfillment of the vision by calling us to reach out to every and to all. God, might you continue to use this seminary to equip those who will carry out the ministry and the mission of the church and those who will carry the good news to the very ends of the earth. Might you use each of us, Lord, to that end, even as we thank you for the privilege of seeing the vision and being a part of its fulfillment through the one who is worthy we pray. Amen.